lean in. If you're feeling hungry, hangry, hang on. It's going to be worth it. This next doctor, I don't actually think I can get through his intro. Or I'll just start bawling. So I'm going to keep it short. Because he's going to do the talking. His name is Dr. Adam Dingle. He's a friend. He's an inspiration. And I'm so grateful to have him here. I wish we could get all the way through that song, but it's You Are My Best, uh, You're the Best Thing by Ray LaMontagne. It's just a beautiful song, but everything I do in my rock, in my life, is sitting right here, over here, Whitney, my wife. Um, she is amazing, and she's definitely the best thing that's ever happened to me. So, um, I got a little bit of a story to start everybody off. So we, uh, I had a really sore night the other night from working out, and I was like, I'm gonna go up, I'm a bath guy just so we're all on the same page. Um, I'm gonna go up and take an Epsom salt bath, calm down, um, do a little reading, and I find out we have no Epsom salt. So, um, frustrated, my wife got these wonderful little bath bombs, and I was like, you know, it's probably got Epsom salt in it, and some uh, essential oils, probably be pretty good. Threw that thing in the tub, red, had a bunch of fun, got out. Dried off, put my gym shorts on, went downstairs, and was talking to my wife and got up to let our dog out. She said, what the heck do you have all over your body? <laughs> Needless to say, this was a glitter bath bomb. <laughs> and I was head to toe in gold glitter. So God just wanted me to shine this week. He got me all ready. And that stuff's really hard to uh, wash off. <laughs> You know, I was reading something the other day that was about this chiropractor. It was an email I got and it said she wanted to be a chiropractor since she was five years old. And I was like, oh, that's great. And you know, my whole practice, I've sat there and I've been like, okay, you know, all these people, they have an uncle or a father or this life-changing injury that was cured by chiropractic or these amazing stories. And I just never had that. I didn't know what it was. Um, you know, I struggled with it a lot because my goal obviously was to help people, but I really didn't know why. I don't even remember what made me choose to be a chiropractor. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just always kind of kind of sat on my soul. But I'm gonna start a little bit about who I am because I think that's a kind of a foundation of this, uh, um, this talk that I'm gonna be talking about today. I um, was raised in Valley Center, Kansas, which is really close to here. Um, spent a lot of my time in Wichita, and uh, I started off uh, in actual Park City, Kansas, and moved over to Valley Center, needless to say. But we, uh, at six years old, my parents got a divorce. I was raised by my mom. Um, my dad wasn't around at all with that, too. And I had a lot of time without a male role model in my life, so that just kind of was one thing that kind of started my whole life out. So fast forward um, to when I was 14 years old, I, uh, I was in a horrible car wreck. So up north of here, we had a car that flipped about six times with me and four of my friends in it. I was the only person left in the car. Everybody was ejected. Um, I had to see something no 14 year old should ever have to see. And it was my best friend lying in a pile of blood on the side of the road. So he passed away, another friend in the car, um, was in a coma for three months. The car was upside down on top of another one of my friends. Um, something that you just can't get over. You know, uh, fast forward a few more years from there, I was 21 years old, my other best friend passed away suddenly. So, no reason why, that we know, um, just, just passed away. And uh, fast forward a few more years from there, I had another good friend of mine, Kelly, um, he was 28, 29 years old, passed away, left two of his daughters and his wife, um, and he wasn't here anymore. During that year, my sister-in-law um, committed suicide at, our, at her house with her two teenage daughters in the house with her. And my father passed away from esophageal cancer around that time. You know, it was just so normal for me to have these negative things happen in my life, you know? 
it uh it, it was just it was you just kind of become callous to it to where it doesn't even it, you feel guilty because you just don't you don't have the feels anymore for it so um i uh fast forward a little bit and this brings us to january of 2016. so we are pregnant with our third baby and um we went in for a normal 20 week ultrasound didn't even want to get it, but for some reason God was tugging us to do it. So um, we went in for the 20-week ultrasound, and our midwife said, "Hey, you know, there's um, there's something going on. He's got some fluid on his brain, fluid on his spine. Uh, I don't really, I can't really handle this or tell you anything, but I can set you up with a maternal fetal medicine specialist. It's Friday. They can see you on Monday. So we get on on Monday, and they told us um, our third baby uh, has spina bifida. It's actually called a myelo meningocele. Ever on Jeopardy? Want to get that one? Um, but the worst form of spina bifida, most people are not chiropractors here. Um, I didn't even know much about it as a chiropractor, but that means his spine was on the outside of his body. Um, that So inside my wife, his nerves, everything was sitting in that amniotic fluid. Now it also pulls down your spinal cord and creates a Chiari tube malformation, which just means your brainstem is wedged into the top two vertebrae of your neck and um, creates hydrocephalus. So that means there's a ton of fluid inside his brain. So they tell us this story of, okay, well he's gonna have learning disabilities. He's gonna have to wear diapers his whole life. Uh, he's not gonna be able to walk. You know, this lesion level probably won't have much, much movement below his knees. Um, it's everything every parent wants to hear in a doctor's office and it was all on a Xeroxed crooked piece of paper they gave us and then they said we're in the United States your first option is termination so um, I don't know what anybody's view is it doesn't matter at this point but that is what they get and then what they tell you you could do uh, the other option is to have surgery after uh, he's born and then the third option or surgery after he's born to fix his back, sorry. Uh, and the, the, the other option is to have this new thing called a fetal repair. So I'll get into that a little bit more, but a fetal repair is basically, um, they, uh, they open up my wife at 25 weeks gestation, so barely halfway through her pregnancy, pull out her uterus, open up the back of her uterus, pull my one pound baby out, fix his back with the pediatric neurosurgery team, put him back in, and keep her pregnant for another three months. Sounds crazy, and I completely understand. It felt crazy. Um, so that was the option we chose to do. God opened doors for us to get this done, and we decided this was our option. This is what we feel like it needs to do. The reasoning behind increases his chances of being able to walk, uh, reverses his Chiari 2 malformation, uh, decreases his hydrocephalus, which decreases his chance of needing a shunt. So a shunt is a tube, goes from the brain down into the tummy and drains all his, his fluid. So those are great, but they create infections, they create, um, they break down. Most kids have a repair on a shunt. Um, I think a few times by the time they're 18, statistically, I think it's like 2.5. So every time you go into the brain, it decreases IQ points. So of course we wanted to do everything we could to help him and we decided to do that surgery. By the grace of God, that five hour procedure of me wearing a path in the hospital was completed um, and everything went well. So we now had the most fearful part and fear is something that's just numb to me. You know, fear, honestly, when you just see the worst case scenario happen in your life so many times, it becomes numb, like fear is just always there. It's such a low threshold, you're freaking out all the time for no reason. I'm a, I'm a freak out. Um, so uh, we had to go that three months of constant contractions. Um, so when you cut open the uterus, it's not a huge fan. So it contracts and they give you medication to hopefully calm down the contractions, but it doesn't really stop it. And um, you know, the risks of this is Whitney's uterus rupturing. You know, that's the biggest risk that would kill my wife and my baby. Um, she had an open womb, a growing baby inside of it. Um, the other risks are preterm labor. So we would be dealing with a child with spina bifida and preterm problems that we would deal with. But God made us realize the risks uh, or the benefits far outweigh the risks. So contractions, contractions, contractions. I just remember laying in bed with Whitney at eight o'clock at night and being like, man, um, let's just go to bed so we can wake up pregnant again tomorrow. Every phone call I got in my office was, oh my gosh, she's going into labor. You know, 
It was just this constant state of agonizing, crippling fear that just doesn't stop. So fast forward through there. Um, she, by the grace of God, made it to 36 weeks and four days. Um, that's uh, good from there. They gave her another C-section, um, pulled out her little baby with a scar on his back instead of the actual decision. So um, then more fear. You know, now we have hydrocephalus. Um, you know, I sat there and, you know, I, it used to kind of tick me off when people were like, it's really ironic, you're a chiropractor and your son has spina bifida. And it really just irritated me and I was like, gosh, I just, it is. But just recently I read something and I was like, this is why. And I wanted to share with you guys, I'm not a huge reader in front of people, so forgive me, my popcorn skills in elementary school weren't that great. <laughs> um, so. This is in a book called The Glory of Going On. Half the people probably don't even know what a green book is. This is like the original chiropractic textbooks. This was written by a guy named B.J. Palmer, who his dad founded chiropractic. So just to give you a little backlash on that. So medical men know medicine does not get sick people well. They've sought cause and cure for centuries. They're still seeking. Year after year, they beg for millions of dollars to research multiple causes and multiple cures for multiple diseases. They still haven't found a simple and single approach to one single disease. Their failures produces a health vacuum, a hiatus between sickness demand and health supply. It was inevitable that someday some person would find a simple and single cause and cure for disease. Chiropractic filled that vacuum and produced a stopgap in that hiatus. That's why I'm a chiropractor, that's why it's not ironic, that's why God gave me Roman. Um, so, at that point, birth, actually way before birth, I'm like, crap, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I called every pediatric chiropractor that I know. Devin was one of them. Um, what do I do, how do I help this kid? His back is split at the base, he's got Chiari, he might have a shun, he's got hydrocephalus, how am I supposed to help with this? And I got all the advice I could, email random people that never met me and never will know who I am. They sent me advice and I put together a care plan for him, adjusted him the day he was born. And since then we've just had these wonderful things, but we still had the medical side of that hiatus. I had to trust that these doctors, who we don't take our kids to doctors, we're one of the weird ones who trust in the body. Uh, we know the body's gonna heal itself. We don't go to the doctor for antibiotics, for the sniffles. Um, so you should have to rely on doctors really stressed me out to have to go through that process. Um, another fear, they're not gonna take me seriously. Um, they're not gonna do what, I, they're gonna respect our wishes. So three months into Roman's birth, this hydrocephalus was bad enough, he had to get a procedure um, called the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. It's a fun word, you can call it ETB for short, um, which is a little hole in the brain that drains his fluid. Um, so he got that done and we prayed and prayed and prayed, please no shunt because the shunt is great, but remember we don't want a piece of hardware in his body his entire life because you cannot take a shunt out. Once it's there, it's there. So three months, that worked well. It, it stopped his head from getting bigger. Um, it, was a, it was a beautiful thing. Six months later, we met with our, our neurosurgeon who we love. He was actually in St. Louis, which is further away um, than where we live. But um, we met with him and he said, you know, what I'm seeing, I want him to be brilliant. I want him to thrive. I think the shunt is the way to go for him. So, uh, God opened that door, we got a shunt placed, and by the grace of God again, he still has had no procedures, no infections, everything is wonderful from his shunt. So, <laughs> I feel like I'm dragging this on a lot, but uh, we, uh, he also had the problems with walking. So, Roman, we take these things really serious with him. So it's, it's not like a normal kid pulling up and you're like, yeah, I mean, that's super exciting. But when he first put pressure on his legs, it was a celebration at our house. There's a chance, we have a chance. Um, when he first took steps with us holding his hands, it was a giant step for him. When he, we got this gold walker, anybody who's ever seen any of his Facebook stuff, he was pretty tricked out, um, but he, uh, <laughs> He, we got it from a friend and we gave it to him the first time and he ran across our living room floor with his brother and sister screaming, laughing, celebrating. Roman's walking, Roman's walking. And he was about 16 months old at that point. Giant situation. And my wife is very impatient. She wants to push him to his limits and I completely and respectfully do that. I'm not as bad as she is. She's, she's, we have baby boot camp at our house with him and she does it. Uh, but. She wanted to get these forearm crutches. She was like, okay, these forearm crutches are 
Most people say you can't have them until you're about four years old. The kids don't understand how to do it. So after we got him from our physical therapist, and after about a week, um, he, a week of really, really trying, he took off walking with him. And, but just a fluke, we got a video of it. So telling our dog Maggie, look Maggie, I'm walking with this crutches. Um, all of a sudden that video started getting shared and shared and shared and shared and millions upon three million and seven million and 10 million and 12 million and then Ellen's calling us and Steve Harvey and um, Pickler and Ben and Good Morning America and all these conversations that we're having with these people, every local news outlet from everywhere, uh, CBS Evening News trying to figure out what's his story? What's going on with this? Um, so he, that is, that's fun. That was a fun ride. But the biggest thing about this is the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of messages we got from people saying, I was getting ready to commit suicide. The hope that that child gave me made me not do it. I was getting ready to have a divorce. And we were so depressed. We have all these things. I haven't prayed to God in years. And he made me pray for the first time. You know, he makes me love life again. And this isn't five, ten people. This is a ton. So many we couldn't even respond. 300, 400 messages a day. So, Roman is rocking life now. He's a chiropractic man. It's what we need, and it's people like Tony that was up here, and Devin who can't help but share the word, it's going from there too. So, I'm a fearful person, like I said, and I am a bullet poison, like just like Tony, so I wanted to make sure to give something that a couple of people could take notes on, on kind of where we're at. Um, we, uh, I found out some kind of anecdotes for fear that's helped me. So I wanted to kind of go over a few of those with you guys. Uh, and they all start with F. I thought she would like that too. There's four of them. Like a teacher. So, uh, first one's faith. Without my faith, I'd be nowhere. I was, I've only been a Christian about half my life. Um, you know, I remember laying in bed, being afraid of I'm going to get AIDS, and my mom coming in and talking to me and giving me a sleep aid or something, being really young. And, you know, teaching my kids now how to pray when they're worried is giant um, in my life. And, you know, I've just been going over this. I've just had this verse in my head, and it's like, I say 4110. I say 4110. I'm like, I don't even know what that says. And I'm for real on this. I feel like God's been poking me and poking me with this. So I finally said, whatever, look it up. So I looked it up. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God's way of saying this is what he wants me to talk about today. Um, the second thing, other than faith, is uh, fellowship. You know, we got to have a tribe. we got to have people that we can talk to and relate to. And I was so scared to open up. I was so scared to tell me that my anxiety was bringing me to the point where I didn't want to be on this planet anymore. I'm so broken. How can my kids love me or respect me if they know how scared I am all the time of everything. My wife has to see me borderline throw up when my son gets a headache, you know, or that he might have a shunt malfunction or he might have this or that or this or that because I think 50 stages in advance. And what I found out recently is there are people, there are those few people that you can get to and talk to and open up to and I'm grateful so much for them in my life. But something all of us need to know is the one person I never opened up to is the one I married. And as a guy, I didn't want to scare her away from me. I didn't want her to dis like not respect me because I'm scared or that I had these feelings. So having to sit and talk to Whitney about that, um, having to open up with that is having to pull back scabs and be like, this is what's going on. This is why I'm like this. And to have her lovingly support me through this has taken such a burden off of me. Um, the other thing is finding F. F other anecdote to fear is finding your uh, ideal self. Um, Tim Young, one of my biggest mentors, um, told me one time to make a list of the characters that you respect in people. Make a list of it and then work towards those lists. He also said it's a never ending journey. Um, so I remember making a list and putting down all these things and what I want and what I want. So we're just so fearful all the time and we're fearful of things that we can control a lot of, you know? Take better care of yourself. For me, I was awful about it. You know, alcohol and 
food and not exercising and just chronic stress, it's like, why don't we do things to become better? Why don't we try to work harder to be a better version of ourselves every day? And that's something that has been a huge impact in my life. And the last F is focus on your now. Denisa talked about it, Devin's talked about it. Um, you know, there's a, I like to run in the mornings and there's a, a, a loop around my house and the last about mile of it, you turn a corner and it's straight uphill. It's awful. It's, uh, I've had to do it for, I think, two or three years now and it's just never fun. But what I do is I, I look at the sidewalk tiles. I don't ever look up at the top of the hill. So each sidewalk tile is sidewalk tiles and you can just digest that so much better. So what are we doing now that we're not Look, we're looking at the end of the run rather than the actual tiles on the ground. What can we do to enjoy today, to enjoy your present self? I would kill to go back and enjoy Rome in his first year of life. With hydrocephalus, I was measuring his head every day. I was feeling a soft spot every time I picked him up. I was so scared of this child, I barely even remember how it felt to have a newborn baby like this. So, to wrap all of this up, you know, I've, I've went through this process and I've seen all this happen and I've seen such the impact on this life and, you know, through all this searching, you know, my, my story that I've been looking for forever found me, you know, and um, it's just working through those things and seeing that and I want to help you guys let your why and your story find you. So one last thing I wanted to do is she's going to freaking hate me for it. I'm gonna have my wife come up here. Yes. And I'm here to show her. So. Sorry about the weight. She wasn't really prepped. <laughs> One thing I want you guys to see right here when they tell you he's not gonna walk, Roman, get over here, big boy. Come here, baby boy. What are you doing? So, the thing to realize, miracles happen every single day. The, title, the motto of this is expect miracles. He is my miracle, and without these two, these are his coaches. These are kids that will have empathy for patients with spine bifida or any, any special needs. They are so loving and caring. They are, it's just amazing to see. I have something on my face. <laughs> yeah, is that silly? Can you say hi? Hi. Uh, and lastly, the love of my life, Whitney. I'm so tremendously grateful for you. But I love you guys so much. I hope my story can help you kind of see things through. And I'm just grateful for your time.